Hello, welcome to my top 20 films of 2017, the rough cut, I'm going to call it, because uh, last year I did my rough cut, top 20 of 2016, and then later on in the year, or the following year, 2017, I did a, a much bigger list video and had caught up on some of the films I wished I'd seen, and so that's what I'm going to do, I think, every year, because around December, January, February, I usually decide to uh, catch up on the stuff that I missed over the previous year. And I've been doing that over the past couple of weeks, and so a few more films have snuck into my top 20 list. Now, before we get into that, some honourable mentions. Just the films that I really liked, first and foremost, uh, and I would class those films as uh, Alien Covenant, uh, The Disaster Artist, uh, Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, that was a great uh, Netflix documentary, uh, Cars 3, I thought was really, really good, uh, Fences, Get Out, might be a controversial choice there, not in the top 20, I thought it was great, but the comedy towards the end kind of dispelled any uh, tension that had been building up so wonderfully, I thought. Uh, Manchester by the Sea, great, but just so depressing. And again, the, the, this, these lists are always my favourite, not what I think are the best movies. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which I watched again uh, last week, and yeah, really, really enjoy it, but there, there's a few things that I don't like. Uh, Logan Lucky... The Florida Project, which I just watched a few hours ago, and I thought that was really, really good. Um, so, yeah, and then films that I loved in 2017 that didn't make the top 20. We have Wonder Woman, Spider-Man Homecoming, Loving Vincent, uh, Wind River, which was great, La La Land, which I thought was fantastic, Dunkirk, massive spectacle, awesome, uh, Okja, Korean film, which I reviewed in Asian cinema season, A Silent Voice, an anime film. Uh, which is very close to cracking my top 20. For a while it was in my top 20. Uh, it, sadly, didn't make the cut, and It was actually my number 5 of the year when I first watched it. I loved it so much. Watched it again at home, didn't hold up as much in terms of the horror elements, but the, um, the, the relationship between the kids and the dialogue and the setting, I still love. But the horror aspect at home didn't hold up so much. Uh, and then The Big Sick which was also my top 20 for a very long time. So let's get into my top 20 of the year. Number 20, A Bride for Rip Van Winkle. This is a Japanese film that I reviewed in Asian cinema season last year, and I really was intrigued and drawn in by the premise, which is that a woman hires actors to play her friends and family at her own wedding. I thought that was going to be the whole movie. It's a three-hour movie. There's also a four-hour TV cut as well, which I really want to see. And I figured... The whole movie is going to be this big three hour kind of epic just covering the wedding and the kind of the dissipation of, of the actors and stuff and the charade being exposed but that aspect of the film is really small. It's this big sprawling epic of this one woman and her very strange journey through emotions and relationships and it was complex and it was flawed but I thought that ultimately it really stuck with me and I thought that it was uh, quite a great film in the end. Number 19, Certain Women, and this is probably the only film on the list that I wouldn't really recommend people to rush out and see, which is a weird thing to say, being in my top 20 of the year, but I absolutely loved it, but it's a very, I don't want to say boring, but that not much happens. Well, I guess things do happen, but it's just, it feels very unremarkable, but I loved that about it. It has these three stories where we follow, you know, as a viewer, three very famous actresses. We have Laura Dern in the first story. We have Michelle Williams in the second, and kind of Kristen Stewart in the third segment. I'll get back to that. And they're just stories about certain women, basically, uh, to kind of very cheesily tie in the title of the movie. All set in the same kind of rough area in Montana. You know, it has a very cold feeling to it, you know, the weather and so on. And, you know, we just see the th these three stories. And the, the middle one is really kind of... Again, unremarkable, but the emotions lying underneath are really interesting. But the third story I was absolutely in love with, and it's about this girl who is uh, looking after these horses on a ranch for a certain amount of time. It's just a job. She's away from home. And one day she decides to just go to a, a local school and sits in on this lesson being taught by uh, a teacher who turns out to be Kristen Stewart's character. And she's a, um, a studying law, and she took this job to teach certain elements of law to kind of pay the bills and so on. And this, uh, this farm girl, uh, played by Lily Gladstone, she becomes attached to this, this kind of teacher. And it's this really like devastatingly sweet and kind of, uh, to me, relatable uh, story that I thought really captured this feeling of 
misconstruing something and uh, and how heartbreaking that can be and I was just so utterly wrapped into that section of the film but also Laura Dern's section I thought was was really captivating too I just love the film uh, but I don't know I, I just don't feel like it's something I can say oh you've got to see it you know but I loved it so there we go number 18 another film starring Kristen Stewart though in a leading role this time personal shopper this film is about a woman who is investigating the the death of her brother in a way because she she's trying to make contact with him um, beyond the realm you know she I think they had a pact she said that uh, if, if one of them died the other one would try and reach out to the other one you know beyond the grave so to speak and and try and make contact and so she's absorbed in this but she's also a personal shopper for this uh, I guess a fashion model in France and so she spends her time in, in Paris and there's a, an amazing sequence in the film to me where Kristen Stewart's character, she goes from Paris to London and then back again on the train. It's like a 20, 25 minute sequence maybe and there's pretty much no dialogue. She's just on a train and she's texting. And it is so gripping and I don't want to explain why. And there's just something about Kristen Stewart, I don't know what it is, I find her so captivating to watch. And it's not that kind of, oh, she's attractive. Uh, yeah, she's pretty, but I mean, there's just something about her acting that really draws me in. Like, still Alice, everyone's like, oh, you know, uh, Julianne Moore was amazing. Yeah, she was, but I was more in, you know, <laughs> impressed by Kristen Stewart. There's something about her that feels so believable in almost everything I see her in, at least over the past few years. And uh, anyway, Personal Shopper, I thought was great. Number 17, Tomorrow I Will Date with Yesterday's You, another Japanese film which I also reviewed as part of Asian cinema season, and this one I feel like is probably the weakest film of the whole top 20. It's a little bit cheesy, in fact I think maybe it's very cheesy, it's this, this romance tale of a man who meets a girl, decides he's gonna tell her this is love at first sight and see what happens and they kind of form this really weird relationship because the way she acts is very strange and there is this kind of science fiction element that plays into it not outlandish it's the, it keeps the characters grounded it doesn't go into space or anything when I say science fiction but there's a time travel element introduced and it just hit me like a fucking truck it put me in this situation where Basically, these characters realize that they're falling in love with each other, and it's a lot more complicated than that, and I love the way that the story play, uh, panned out, because even when I started piecing together what was happening, it still ended up surprising me, even though parts were predictable. But it, it made me kind of evaluate my own life and my own relationship with Connie and how uh, precious time is, you know. And so the fact that, yeah, maybe it's a bit cheesy, a bit kind of uh, uh, rote, but it really connected with me and I, I really enjoyed watching those characters they had a great chemistry together and so that was one of the most memorable films of the year for me so that's why it's on the list number 16 Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets had no idea what to expect with this I really enjoy Luc Besson's films I know a lot of people look down on Lucy I loved Lucy I thought that was a really great action sci-fi film and of course you know Fifth Element love that Leon the Professional there's more of his I haven't seen but this I was excited about the potential of, and I, I, it's funny, back to Chronicle with Dane DeHaan, I thought this guy's going to be something special, and he's continually had these kind of semi-big roles, but he hasn't seemed to have really hit his footing yet, I really thought he'd be the next big thing, and uh, some could argue that he is, he is doing great stuff, but um, I was really intrigued to see him in this role, and I think he's so perfectly ill-suited, like, he, he shouldn't be the character he is in this film, and that's kind of part of the charm of it, and then we have Cara uh, Delevingne, who still gets so much stick because she's a model, but in every film I've seen her in, I think she's been really good, and I, I think your enjoyment of this film rests on their chemistry together, because beyond that, the world building, uh, based off a graphic novel, but still the world building that Luc Besson injects into this film is really something incredible, and the fact that this is um, an independent film, you know, <laughs> I think it's one of the most expensive independent films ever made, the scope is stunning, like he went all out with this film and I just loved everything about it. You know, there's a few things here and there that perhaps could have been better, but overall, bell to bell from, you know, the whole film, everything encompassing it, I thought was just such a wild, wacky, fun sci-fi space adventure. It reminded me of Star Wars in a way that it was just showing you these things you'd never seen before, being inventive with the, the world that it was creating, and uh, I loved it and I can't wait to see it again. Number 15, Ingrid Goes West. I only watched this about a week ago, I'm glad I did because it really uh, just blew me away. I thought it was a great film. It's about this girl called Ingrid who has recently recovered from a bit of a 
episode where she was stalking someone through Instagram um, who had become friends with her but hadn't really and she'd looked too much into it and she'd become a bit clingy and it exploded in this incident that you see at the very beginning of the film so she goes to kind of uh, this facility and when she's released she gets a load of money from uh, her mother who just recently passed away and she decides to move to LA and she finds this woman in LA on Instagram called Taylor played by Elizabeth Olsen who's one of my favorite actresses I think that she's great and she's really good in this film with a character that has a few twists to her I think and uh, I think you know people could kind of say oh it's, it's an easy role to play but I think that the way that Elizabeth Olsen plays Taylor in the film is is very key to, to the whole theme of the movie and she does it very well so Ingrid kind of follows Taylor on, on Instagram she kind of follows in the footsteps of her previous failures and it gets into very kind of almost horror movie stalker-esque kind of and it's weird to kind of have the main character be the person who is you know doing these things that you I mean I'm, I was watching the film just like oh my god like more than I would a horror film you know I was like oh my god she's not doing this this is so awkward but I was so gripped at the same time I was captivated by what was going on um, I think Ice Cube's son plays uh, Ingrid's landlord I thought he was great and also loved his kind of character quirk of being a huge Batman Forever fan <laughs> which I thought was just wonderful uh, but um, uh, Aubrey Plaza plays Ingrid and she is incredible in the film I and mean, this is a film that deals with mental illness you know but it also deals with uh, you know the, the whole social media thing I guess you could look at this film and say oh it's a social media commentary and it is in one sense but it isn't in another it's not as simple as that. It, uh, it needs more credit than that. It's not just uh, social media is bad, you know, relying on it too much is bad and, and living your life virtually is bad. Um, but it goes into the kind of artifice of, of uh, society, the way that we um, invent this version of ourselves, whether it be through Instagram or in person. And when Ingrid and Taylor strike up this, this friendship, there's a wonderful bit where Taylor says something to the effect of, oh my God, you're, you're my favorite person I've ever met. You're amazing. And it's that kind of glad-handing kind of trend that has seeped into, again, society, that is just so alarming. You know, it's that idea of if everything is awesome, then nothing is awesome, you know. And that's kind of perfectly encapsulated in Taylor's character. And I just love where it went. It was funny, uh, it moved me, and uh, had a lot to say at the same time. Number 14, Split, and I realize at this point I'm talking a lot about the film, so if I've talked about them before, I'll try and be a bit more brief. I did review this film. Uh, I thought this was incredible by M. Night uh, Shyamalan. I hadn't seen uh, Unbreakable, is it? The kind of first film in this now trilogy. There's going to be a new one coming out, I think, probably this year or the year after. I thought this was great. Didn't get the twist at the end because I hadn't seen the previous film, but just the performance of James McAvoy, who's one of my favorite actors and has been for... You know, well over 10 years going back to Shameless uh, 2004 in the UK on the TV but I've loved watching him kind of progress as a great actor doing these bigger movies and then these smaller movies and just his performances are always really interesting to me. There's a great film he did a few years ago called Filth which is a very extreme movie but um, he's just, I mean that was Oscar worthy to me. Uh, and here he's just fantastic playing all these multiple personalities and um, it's a great thriller. I thought it was an absolute A-class thriller. Didn't like where it went towards the end of the film but I guess that ties into the previous one so I'm intrigued to see where I'm going to uh, kind of land on Split once I've seen the first one and then the third one coming out. So, uh, But I still thought it was great and one of my favorite films of the year. Number 13, Lion, which was one of the films I watched during my kind of Oscar weekend marathon back in March, whenever the Oscars was in 2007. I watched like 10 films, I think, over the weekend. And this one broke me. An incredible true story of this uh, young Indian boy who gets who got lost at home in India on a train and ended up hundreds of miles away from home. And he ends up getting shipped, I think a few years later maybe, to Australia where he gets kind of uh, relocated. He gets a family that loves him and he, he grew up in Australia. And, um, you know, obsessed about his home where he would got lost from. And over many years um, searching on Google Earth, he finally found his home. It's an incredible true story, um, and I, I really love the acting in the film. I think Nicole Kidman was really great in a fairly small role, even though her role in his life was huge. Uh, in the film, she doesn't have much screen time, but I thought she was great. And uh, Rooney Mara, who's another one of my favorite actresses, was just there, unfortunately. Um, but I think the true story is so incredible. I love how we follow the young... Um, you know, Indian boy at the very beginning of the film for like 40, 45, it was like a, pretty much a foreign film to begin with, the first kind of uh, 40, 45 minutes I think, and then we flash forward to when he's a, you know, a 
I guess, late teens, early 20s. And what really got me is when they showed the real footage at the end of the, you know, his, his new mother meeting his, his old mother, his real mother. Oh, I, I was, tears were streaming. I thought it was an incredible film, very emotional. The, the score was really uh, outstanding, but um, just wonderful justice to an incredible true story. Number 12, Baby Driver. Yeah, I, this was a lot higher initially, but the more I think about it, the more it kind of got pushed a little bit out of that top 10. That's not to say I didn't love it, I thought it was fantastic. And I think I, I read the other day, was it James? James Merchant? I'll, I'll drop his name again. I uh, hated it, which was really surprised me, but I, I, I understand that if you don't like what Baby Driver is offering, you're not going to like it. Like it, it, it really commits to its gimmick, which is using music uh, through the character of Baby um, and the, the the beat of the music and the, the lyrics and everything that go with that. And Edgar Wright, one of my favorite directors, just nailed it. You know, I, I thought that he did an amazing job, and it was. I felt like this was really Edgar Wright's kind of coming out party, which sounds really stupid because he's been directing great stuff since like 1999, but. You know, with Simon Pegg, with Nick Frost, you know, the Cornetto trilogy, and Scott Pilgrim was very good, but I feel like this was his kind of first chance to really break out of that a little bit, you know, because it's a really funny film, and it's not with Simon Pegg, it's not with Nick Frost, it's with a different kind of cast, it feels different, but it feels like his movie at the same time, and I was more impressed by how fun it was, given the fact that he wasn't kind of working with and writing the film with Simon Pegg, who I think is a very funny writer in his own way, and the way that he works with Edgar Wright, but Baby Driver, just so much fun just an absolute blast from start to finish and this is where we do get into like the you know five out of five ten out of tens for me i loved baby driver and if i watch it again it, it might be like oh my god it's even better and it would go straight into the top 10 or top five but for now this is where it's at number 11 call me by your name this is a romance film by a teenage boy uh, named elio i think he's around 17 18 years old and he's staying with his parents in a, a villa in italy for the summer and his father's work is to do with archaeology and he gets one of his assistants to come over uh, to stay for six weeks played by army hammer uh, oliver who's i guess in his late 20s and elio falls for oliver um, so we have this this younger man and a slightly older man kind of having this romantic relationship blossom over this two-hour movie where people lounge about and kind of, you know, play music and, and do all this kind of, you know, refined cultural stuff. But underneath all that is this very passionate and uh, suppressed <laughs> romantic relationship between these two men. And there was just something about it, and a lot of people have rated this very highly, and in some ways I would put this like in my top five, but in other ways I, I, I need to have it outside of the top ten. I'm really intrigued to see how this holds up a second time around. I loved the restraint of the film, that there's not really a beat where they're like, you know, oh, I love you, or, oh, you know, da-da-da-da-da. It, it's very kind of under the surface, and played, with, again, with such restrained passion by both actors, I thought, and it really captured that feeling of the absolute unadulterated joy you feel um, when you're just in love with someone and it's fresh and it's new and you know I think anyone who's kind of been in love when they were young can remember a time where they just wanted to be alone together and there's all these things get parents you know uh, social situations you know they just want to get alone together and when these two get alone together there's this kind of just uninhibited kind of outburst of just joy and I thought that was just it just fucking lifted me up so much it was so much fun to see and uh, it moved me as well and you know I don't want to go too much into the ending but there's a few things in it that I, I the, the main problem I had was that the there's this one kind of sexual scene that uh, it's more the implication of it that I was just like nah, that's a bit much that's a bit much um, but for the most part, the sex scenes are very much more implied and they don't go too explicit, which I really liked, but I totally believed this romance and the two actors did an amazing job. And particularly the actor who plays Elio's father, who I've seen in loads of films, he was so like devastatingly brilliant in the film, in the final scene where he has a chat with his son and, and basically just says like, I know, and it's more than all right. And just, and, and it's just, it really got me, it really did. So. Fantastic film. 
Number 10, The Red Turtle, a kind of Studio Ghibli film, not really officially, it was co-produced by Studio Ghibli but made by a uh, European animation director, and this is a film completely without dialogue. Uh, I would recommend you watch the review by Man Vs. Film, Graham, I'll try and link that at the end of this video if I can, he did a very good review of the film and kind of summed it up much better than I probably could, but it's this, this animated film without words, you know, there's kind of maybe a, hey, uh, that, that's it, you know, about a man who gets stranded on a desert island, and it follows the tropes of those movies, but it takes it into a completely different direction when the titular Red Turtle turns up, and it becomes a lot more spiritual, and by the end it was just this, this experience that, that summed up life, and kind of the circle of all living things, and the human experience, uh, just told in this way that, I mean, I just feel like anyone in the world could watch this and get something out of it, because there's no language, you know. Um, but yeah, I thought it was wonderful, fantastic, and, and had to be in the top ten. Uh, even if at the very bottom, at the bottom, I guess you'd call it of the top ten. But regardless, I think that it was just one of the. And in this, I, I would say this is definitely where my preference for um, putting in my favorites, but also putting in what I think are great films that need more attention. You know, I probably would prefer to watch other films uh, over this, um, but. I think that uh, it needed to be in there. Like, I, I do kind of judge what's great, uh, but also what I enjoy, but this is where they kind of both go up and down a little bit, because I think I probably want to watch Baby Driver more than The Red Turtle, but I think The Red Turtle is just a much better film in its own way, so, yeah. I'm just waffling on about this one in a really weird way, so I'll leave that one where it is. The Red Turtle, fantastic film. Number nine, and this is where it kind of goes back on itself because I don't think that this is as good of a film as The Red Turtle, but I enjoyed it so much more um, and was impressed by it more because it is essentially, uh, you know, just bits of clay molded together and it made me really emotional and that's kind of weird. It is um, My Life as a Courgette, which is a French or Belgian animated film, stop motion, and the best way I can describe the art style, uh, very kind of crudely, is Tim Burton stop motion animation style, but with color injected into every object. It's very vibrant, very primary colors, and it's this film that deals with these bright images um, portraying very dark and insular themes of abuse um, and neglect, and we have this young boy whose nickname is Courgette, his mum mum gave him the nickname, and he uh, has an unfortunate incident at the beginning of the film, he has to go and live in this care home where other kids whose parents have kind of gone astray have been collected, and they kind of, you know, you, you kind of know where it's going, you know, they kind of, you know, standoffish at first, and then they learn to kind of grow and heal together. It's only like an hour and five minutes long, and it was just so life-affirming, and uh, touching, you know, fantastic film. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. Number eight, Moonlight, the film that won the Oscar for Best Picture last year. Obviously, it came out the year before. And again, I always go by the year that it came out in the country that I live in. So there we go. That's why La La Land is in my 2017 list, etc. Moonlight, just fantastic drama. Just, just really is. And I love the concept of sh showing this young man growing up and, and having three actors portray him as a young boy, a teenager, and a young man. And I love the performance um, of the guy who played him in the, th the, the third section of the film. And I love the way, I've talked about it before, I love the way that uh, uh, the convention of his character in the third part of the film was kind of flipped around a bit because he has become this guy who is this like muscle bound kind of you know very physically intimidating guy to look at but is just carrying around all these delicate emotions that he's been withholding his entire life and uh, I, I thought it was a fantastic film the direction in particular was stunning like it's a great drama in terms of the acting and the story and where the character goes but the way that Barry Jenkins directed the film was so delicate and heartbreaking and crushing. Uh, Naomi, um, oh, what's her name? Naomi Harris, no, I think, um, who plays his mother. Fucking, fun. she should have won the Oscar for that, I'm sorry. She was incredible in the film. She really got to me. Um, and then the, the guy who played um, his, I don't even call it, father figure in the first part of the film, he won the Oscar, which I thought was uh, uh, actually worthy as well because he really made an impression. Overall, Moonlight, I thought, was awesome. Number seven, and again, we're at odds with how good a film is and how much I enjoyed it, Thor Ragnarok. Holy shit, this film was incredible. I, like, from a visual standpoint, it looks stunning. 
the soundtrack, this rousing kind of synth-drenched kind of throwback 80s score, which, you know, is definitely a trope of the times, but I'll take it. I I'll take all of it. I think the score was awesome. Using Led Zeppelin was fantastic, and I love how they, they really used it. <laughs> they really milked their license for the, um, the Immigrant song. I love Chris Hemsworth as Thor. Uh, always have done. I love the first two Thor movies. This is easily my favorite. In fact, this is probably my favorite um, MCU movie, Marvel Cinematic Universe film. Not the best, wouldn't even crack the top five, but probably my favorite. Just such a blast from start to finish. I love the different flavor that Taika Waititi in, in, injected into the film uh, and inflected into the film because he stars in the film as Korg and just his, his very New Zealand way of speaking in this rock CGI monster was one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen. Uh, just the the scene where he's like, "Oh, we're trying to organize a revolution, but I, I couldn't print off enough pamphlets." Like that just happened in a Marvel movie, and it's amazing. Yeah, piss off, Ghost. Awesome. And then Jeff Goldblum, you know, one of my favorite kind of character actors. Just <laughs> I want to go back to that cinema experience because everyone was roaring with laughter, and it was such a good time. Hulk, Thor. Ah, oh, it was awesome. I also loved. Um, Ah, oh, what's her name? Uh, Kate Blanchett, just hamming it up as, as healer. Awesome, loved it. Number six, Close Knit, uh, another Japanese film, and this is a a drama. You know, this is a, a melodrama, in fact, you might say. And this one really got to me. It's about a young girl who, and I, another one I reviewed for Asian Cinema Season. So full thoughts, go check that video out if you're interested. About a young girl whose mother has has left um, left her some money to kind of fend for herself. She's very young, maybe like eight, nine, ten. Her mother's gone, so she goes and stays with her uncle. It's implied that this has happened before. But now, this time, her uncle has a new girlfriend, who is a transsexual, used to be a man. And I thought, okay, it's going to be one of those movies where it uh, you know, shines a light on you know, transsexuals and so on, and I, I was ready to be taken on that, that story. But what I loved about the film was that it was, it was like an LGBT movie, um, that, that wasn't trying to be in a way, you know, it's um, I, I think it, it sometimes raises the issues better when you don't lean into it so much You know, I mean, it's definitely a part of the story and this young girl kind of being like Why do you have breasts? You know, and there's a very kind of cute uh, Exchange that builds throughout the film based around the the, the kind of fake breasts that he has or that she has and it kind of by you know, halfway through the film, it didn't matter. I was I was often forgetting the fact really, and just focusing on the characters and this kind of new family unit that formed that I became so attached to, and I just loved the the theme of acceptance in the film, because again halfway through halfway through to me there wasn't much of a you know an issue with it. It was just this 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 woman who was in this girl's life to kind of be a mother that she needed at the time, but also her uncle as well, and it was just such a touching movie. But also by the end of the film. You know, I knew what I wanted in my heart of hearts. I wanted the happy ending. I wanted that everything is rosy at the end. Um, and not to say that it has a bad ending, but it plays out much more truer. And in a way that I really respect, and by my morals, is the way I think it should go. If that situation was real. And it's not the one that pleases you as an audience member, but it's the right choice. And so I just, I, I clapped at the end. I thought, that is the right way to do it. And so I was really surprised by this film. And yeah, a lot of people probably watch this and say, oh, it's one of those very cheesy kind of Japanese family dramas. And sure, if that's the way it sits with you, that's the way it does. But for me, I loved it and uh, had to be this high on my list. Number five, and this is where we basically just get into all out genre films. You really see where my heart lies when it comes to my favorite movies. And I think five, four and three are kind of all interchangeable. Either of them could be in the same spot pretty much, it's just kind of splitting hairs at this point. But three films I absolutely loved, and I find it hard to separate them, you know. And uh, they all deal with kind of similar themes, with different themes, you know, and, and they're very different films. But um, they all kind of did the same thing, where I walked out of the cinema like, that was fucking phenomenal. And this one is War for the Planet of the Apes. I was so surprised with the first one, Rise, or the first of the rebooted series, Rise to the Planet of the Apes, in 2011. There's a few things I didn't like, but mainly I thought it was stellar. Dawn is just one of my favorite films of all time, and I, I can't believe it. They managed to at least match that film in terms of how good it was. There's a scene where um, Oscar, Oscar, what are we talking about? Uh, Caesar, yeah. I was going to say that Andy Serkis deserves an Oscar for this performance, but <laughs> Caesar, the character that Andy Serkis plays with motion capture, He's merely reacting to something. He sees something, then he kind of just looks towards, almost towards the camera, 
And it's like one of the best kind of acted moments of 2017 for me. And it's it's this digital creation, but it's the performance that informs the 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 digital and um, you know the artistry of the people doing the animation. It goes hand in hand, and uh, those two forms create something truly unforgettable to me. Uh, it's a great war movie, which is what it really needed to be, and it's a perfect way to round out the trilogy. I'm kind of glad it didn't do big money, because I think they should just leave it there and leave that incredible trilogy that they made and, and just call it a day, because uh, awesome. I still prefer Dawn, but I think that War is just as good, if not even a little bit better, incredible movie. Number four, Blade Runner 2049. As a big fan of the first film, I thought, oh, don't do another one of these. Come on, you're never going to get close. They got close. <laughs> like, I couldn't believe how close the original they got this. Not in terms of even the visuals and the aesthetics, but the story. You know, and it, it very much deals with the events of the first film, but it's, it's its own thing at the same time. And I liked how it dealed with AI in different ways, like the character of Joy, the holographic um, companion of Ryan Gosling's character, Kay. Her character I thought was great. Um, Harrison Ford was on fine form as uh, Deckard. And the only kind of weak link I think was, for me, Jared Leto's character, who I just, whenever he talked, I just wasn't really taking in what he was saying. Uh, I seem to have a kind of a, a block, a mental block with Jared Leto for some reason. But overall, it was just so unforgettable visually. The sound design, the music, just an overall experience. It kind of is one of those rare sequels that really works hand in hand with the original, uh, even though so many years have passed since that original. And uh, I just can't believe they made it as good as they did. Number three, Logan. Whew. Uh, what more needs to be said about it? If you've seen it, then you know, or maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you don't agree. I don't know, but I just thought it was, it, I think it's my favorite comic book movie, which is, is really tough. To, maybe Batman would kind of just beat it a little bit. But I think it's just oh, so involving, so gripping. Uh, Hugh Jackman is on amazing form, you know. And I'm definitely at this point. I'm talking about my favorite films of the year. Just re recycling the words, amazing, incredible, stellar, whatever. But awesome. Just uh, it really took me aback. I was really excited for it, but it just so exceeded my expectations. And in fact, I said that War of the Planet of the Apes, Blade Runner, and this one would be interchangeable. Scratch that. It's Blade Runner and Wolf by the Apes that I could kind of put in either spot. Logan definitely is a notch above those two films for me because you have three incredible performances from Hugh Jackman, Patrick Stewart, and Daphne Keane, who plays Laura. And when we saw the trailers, I'm like, oh, they're going to, they're going to do kind of like a Last of Us kind of storyline here. I mean, you know, Hugh Jackman looked very Joel esque with his, his full beard as, as Logan, but it's a much different relationship than that. And I loved how it stayed true to the character of Wolverine. Um, and the way he dealt with this girl, and also just that kind of unforgiven style, kind of last hurrah for this character. It's just something we haven't really seen before. Someone who's played an iconic role like that over like nine movies, uh, over almost 20 years, and we've seen Hugh Jackman grow as an actor, as a person, uh, and then also as this character. And it's just, it, it's one of the great kind of uh, iconic roles, I think, of an actor's career. He did an, an amazing job, and in any X-Men film that maybe wasn't the best, he was always, I think, the, the shining star of it. And this one, he got his real send-off that I think he deserved. And uh, he worked hard for it, and he delivered. I thought it was amazing. Number two, and this is going to be super controversial. I can see the comments coming a mile off. In fact, we've already kind of discussed this on Facebook. But if, you, if you're unhappy with my number two pick for 2017, and you don't want to count it in your personal canon, fine, all you need to do is go through my, you know, number 20 to number 2, or number 3, and uh, take a number off each film, and then the new number 20 would be the big sick for me. Alright, okay, let's get to it. Twin Peaks The Return. Oh, it's a TV show. It's not a movie. Well, yeah, I'd say that too, but I was starting to see that various film publications were actually classing Twin Peaks The Return as a film. Uh, Sight and Sound had it as their number two of the year, and you can say maybe it's pretentious to do this kind of thing, but my kind of rationale is that, one, it was shot as an 18-hour movie. There was no kind of episode one, episode two. It was this 18-hour script, and it was shot as a movie. An extremely long one, and obviously put up, put into episodes for TV. David Lynch himself has said, I don't see it as a, a show, I see it as a film. The only difference is instead of being put on a truck to go to a cinema, it's being put on a truck to go to um, TV. 
And then thirdly, it has been screened theatrically, at least some of the episodes, and uh, this month they're screening the entire thing. Also, it's just, it's, 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 it's a better movie than most movies, you know. Uh, it did something that the original Twin Peaks series um, really started a trend of, which was doing a cinematic kind of um, visual experience on television, not in a cinema. You know, just the framing of it and the composition, but just the storytelling. And you look at TV now, it's become very cinematic. It rivals the storytelling of, of movies and sometimes betters it as well. You look at something like Breaking Bad and The Sopranos, you know, all these incredible TV shows and Netflix, it's really becoming a huge thing. Becoming, it has been a huge thing for a very long time, and it's only getting bigger. Game of Thrones, another example. And you could say, well, does that mean you can class every the latest episode of Game of Thrones as a movie? Well, no. Another thing is that David Lynch, in his 70s, directed the entire thing, all 18 episodes, the 18 hour block. You know, uh, it's an incredible achievement, but to me, it was one of the best, I think, just movie slash TV show shows. TV schlow, I'll leave that one in for free. <laughs> one of the best kind of viewing experiences I've had ever. You know, coming off, you know, getting into the, the original series and the, the movie and everything, uh, and then watching this new series. I've seen it twice already. I've seen this 18 hour movie twice. You know, that, that's taken up for, you know, 30, what would it be? 36 hours of my life in 2017. And it was just as good, if not better, the second time around. I got more out of it, you know. It's it's a it's an experience. It's a film that uh, that made me laugh so much that tears were streaming down my face. I had to rewind the same part back thirty times. It, it moved me deeply, like right in my chest. Uh, it made my jaw drop. Um, it surprised me. You know, it, it confused me. It baffled me. It, uh, it it filled me with awe. Like that episode eight nuclear bomb sequence. I was just like. It was just overwhelming. You can see it in the reaction video I did, um, and they're just being so happy that tears were, were kind of you know rolling down my cheeks. Just awesome. And then the the final episode, you know, I was so gutted by it that like, it just ruined my entire day. I went to bed early because I just didn't want to be awake, you know. And then it grew on me. But to me, it's just it's it's just one of the best things I think I've ever seen. So to me, it's my number two film of 2017. And at the end of the day, it's my list, and it counts. And, and who cares what I have to say anyway, so it is what it is. Number one. What do you think? Of course, my number one film of the year is the movie everyone's talking about, starring Mark Hamill, Brigsby Bear. Uh, Brigsby Bear is about this guy who watches this TV show, this kind of kids TV show, that, that's made just him. And it's such an offbeat kind of story that, you know, obviously I'm talking about Star Wars The Last Jedi. Episode 8. <sighs> Brings me bear though. Check it out. Um, Star Wars Episode 8 The Last Jedi, my number one film of 2017. My number one film of the decade. Um, my number one film of the century, I think. I love it. It's one of my new favorite films of all time. I've seen it seven times at this point. Um, which I've been told means I need help, <laughs> to which I say, well, hey, look, you know, I'm having the time of my life going to watch this film over and over again, and, you know, you just got to hold on to it while you can, you know, I, I, I will forever want to go back to that Friday night viewing of The Last Jedi, I'd seen it a couple of times already, but that third viewing in this packed Friday night audience, everyone reacting like crazy to all the big moments is just the best, I, the best cinema experience I think I've ever had. Connie was there with me to experience it for the first time. I remember her kind of gasping at the, the right moments and it was just everything I could ever want from a movie. Um, is it, a, you know, the greatest film ever? No, you know, is, is it the best Star Wars film? No, I don't think so. It's just um, an experience, you know. And I'm going to talk about it more in future videos, I'm sure. I'll be talking about this film for the rest of my life. I'll be def defending it, no doubt, for the rest of my life. In fact, tonight, uh, I'm still kind of buzzing off of this. I was listening to Chris Jericho's podcast about the top films of the year, top uh, songs and you know albums of the year and stuff, and they got talking about Star Wars, and he's a big Star Wars fan. And Chris Jericho was saying like, oh, you know, one thing I really hated was that you know Luke didn't show up at the end for real. You know, he should have flown in on that X-wing and, and blown up the First Order and you know saved the day. And I just, uh, that's one of the things that I just don't agree with. So I replied to him on Twitter just for the hell of it. I, th I said, look. The whole point is, you know, a Jedi uses his strength for knowledge and defense, never for attack. 
Him doing that wasn't pointless, it achieved so much because it was the last notch on this incredible legacy of this mythical Luke Skywalker, and he re-sparked this hope that he had kind of began on his journey in the very first movie. He was the new hope, and at the end of his life, he brought that hope back and reignited it in the galaxy, which had been completely lacking in hope, which is the whole point of the film. They had gotten so bad, and people had lost so much hope. They needed it back, and Luke Skywalker was the guy to do it with this crazy thing that he did. And uh, so it's not the coolest ending, but it's the most fitting one. And he replied to it and said, well said, points taken. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> like, I just love how, you know, this whole explosion of The Last Jedi, people saying, oh, shit, it's terrible, Luke should have done this, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I'm defending it and saying, well, this, you know, there's this, and then there's this, this, you know, it really does make sense. And people just say, no, fuck you. And the only person to go, to go, okay, yeah, that's a good point. It was fucking Chris Jericho. <laughs> what kind of a world are we living in? You know, people fucking filming dead bodies in forests, Chris Jericho kind of conceding a point I had against him. Absolutely crazy. But yeah, Star Wars The Last Jedi, I talked about it for two fucking hours. Uh, in the beginning of the road to episode 9, so if you want to hear my full thoughts on that film, you can, and I'll, again, I'll I'll probably be talking about it more uh, over the next few weeks and months, but to me, it's, it's far and away my number one film of the year, and one of my favorite films of all time, for sure. Uh, the fact that I, I cried on the sixth viewing should tell you that much, and if you think I'm a blind fanboy for enjoying it and all that kind of stuff, then... I'm the world's happiest blind fanboy right now because I'm actually about to go watch it for an eighth time just to round it up because it's episode eight but also because I'm going to see it in IMAX which I'm looking forward to. So there we go, that's it. That's my top 20 of the year. Much longer than it was last year. I apologize but what the hell. We got into it. I got into it. Leave your list down below what you liked and this is the rough cut so there's a lot more I want to get to at least 30 that I have on my list which means I'll probably get to like 5 or 10 of them so at some point in 2018 you'll see my my finalized version of my favorite films of 2017 and we'll see another episode of The List so look forward to that and again leave your favorite films down below I'll see you in the next video and thanks for watching hey, <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans of Carlin into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. But he's not quite as cool as you. Cause...